Welcome to part 3 of my series of videos on setting up the Vista 20 alarm panel. Part 1 covered all the necessary equipment you would need for every alarm system. Part 2 covered how you would hook up all that equipment. Up to this point everything we've covered has been on the main alarm panel side of the circuit. In this video we'll switch over to sensors. Since every security application is unique, what I'll do is just tell you what sensors are available that I know of. Knowing which sensors are available should give you a more thorough understanding of your capabilities of your new alarm system. This is also the first video in which I will be showing you my alarm training center that I built. Teaching yourself alarm installation involves a great deal of trial and error. A training center serves two purposes. The first one is, you are not experimenting on your own home alarm. If you make a mistake, no big deal. S reset it to factory defaults and start over. The second purpose is, with the house simulator like this, you can open and close switches to simulate opening and closing windows and immediately see the results on the panel. Using your home alarm system, you'd open a window then have to run over to the control panel and hope you didn't miss anything. Okay, let's move on to sensors. There are three ways to hook sensors up to your panel. Hardwired with two conductor cable. This is the most common application for hardwired systems. The reason is most sensors output either an open or a short, so all you need is two wires to complete the circuit. Other more advanced sensors require four wires. For example, some of the more advanced smoke detectors allow your alarm panel to reset the smoke detector to see if another fault has been detected. This is a process that cuts down on the number of false alarms. Additionally, many sensors out there have a tamper circuit. A tamper circuit should be used any time a component of your alarm system is accessible by the general public. Normally it consists of a small switch mounted inside the cover of the component. The third method for hooking up a sensor would be wireless. Wireless sensors are simple to hook up. Simply hook up your 5800 series receiver, install your sensor, then program your alarm panel to recognize the serial number of that sensor. Then you're done. We'll cover that programming in another video. Something else you should be aware of. Wireless is expensive. This wireless sensor is probably between $35 and $40. While this hardwired sensor that does the same job is about $3. Installing hardwired sensors takes a little bit of work. You'll become very familiar with the following tools. Standard drill bits for drilling small holes. Spade drill bits for larger holes. But if you're spoiled, you'll upgrade to the Forstner drill bits. With these bits, you can drill a 3-inch hole without even breaking a sweat. Of course, don't forget your steel fish tape for rotten wires behind walls. Here's a neat trick. I've removed the carpet in this room. Underneath the trim that runs along the wall, you'll see there's plenty of room to squeeze a couple wires. You can go all the way around the room without drilling a single hole. But since there's plenty of videos out there on how to install wiring behind walls, we're just going to move on. Let's get back to sensors. The most common perimeter sensor you'll encounter is the reed switch. The piece on the far side has a magnet in it. When the magnet comes close to the side with the wires attached, depending on how you've wired it, your normally open or normally closed switch will actuate. It's pretty much that simple. Here we see the wireless version of the reed switch. It operates exactly the same but sends radio waves. And a wireless mounted on a door. As we start looking at areas that need protecting in our schematic, the reed switch will be used on the garage door, any other door that you may have in the house, and all windows that actually open. They do have much smaller versions of the reed switch. They're designed to be concealed in the door jam, so you can't even tell there's an alarm system installed. And of course, wireless concealable reed switches. You can actually have your alarm system monitor whether your deadbolts are closed or not. Here's something that'll amaze you. You take a plunger style adjustable tamper switch, then install it in the door frame so that when the deadbolt is closed, it'll push on the tamper switch activating it. After installation, the screw allows you to adjust for proper calibration. Obviously, this is easier done on new home installations. Using the combination of the reed switch and the tamper switch, your alarm will tell you the door is closed and locked. Next, let's talk about asset protection. You have something you don't want moved or touched, like a safe or an expensive pitcher. That's where this little device comes in handy. It has built-in accelerometers in it that will activate an alarm condition if the object is moved. If a criminal gets past your door and window switches without setting the alarm off, 
it's time for your interior alarm system to go to work. You mount motion detectors where a person would normally have to walk, like the living room or down a hallway. Motion sensors can either be infrared or microwave. Or combine both technologies to come up with this pet immune motion sensor. In theory, it'll ignore animals smaller than 70 pounds, like maybe a dog. But it doesn't handle vertical movement very well, so it may not be so reliable around a cat since they spend a lot of time moving up and down. They also have outdoor motion sensors. You could use this at your front door or maybe out at the swimming pool. You can program this as a monitor zone in your alarm panel. That way it simply tells you there's someone there but doesn't trigger your alarm. It's time to protect your glass. I know of two technologies for this. The first is shock sensors that you mount directly on the window. I personally prefer the acoustical sensor. You mount this on the wall in the room and it monitors several windows at the same time. It literally listens for the sound of breaking glass. Moving back into the garage, let's protect your cars. As long as the weight of the car is on this sensor, you don't have an alarm condition. Remove the car from the sensor, you know your son took the car out for a joyride. I've been told by boat owners that drilling holes to mount sensors and route wiring is probably not cool. So they may want to take this route, the pressure mat sensor. Simply hide it underneath your mat or carpet and when somebody steps on it, it will activate the alarm. Uh, let's do some talking about smoke, fire, and air quality sensors. In previous videos, we've already mentioned that Zone 1 is dedicated to the two-wire smoke detector. Don't worry, you can reprogram that function. You can get sensors that combine both smoke and heat detection, and this one's wireless. And it's also pretty, pretty important to have a carbon monoxide detector in your system. Here's a note of caution. In your kitchen and your garage, you don't want to use smoke detectors. The steam from cooking and the gases from the automobile will cause smoke detectors to activate. Instead, use a heat detector. It looks for two things. A rapid rise in temperature, or if temperature exceeds a maximum value, an alarm will be sounded. If you want to protect something on the outside of your house, or simply have a driveway monitor, you can install an active infrared fence. Place the two monitors about 40 meters apart, and infrared beams will detect anything that moves between the two sensors. Do you have a vacation home or a remote garage where you're concerned about the temperature dropping below freezing? They have a sensor for that. You'll notice you can't use this in a freezer. I've got a lot of money tied up in food in my freezer. If the freezer temperature rises, I want to know about it. So you grab this 5821 sensor, hook it up to this temperature probe, put the probe in your freezer, and your alarm system will notify you if your freezer is thawing out. You'll also notice the sensor can do double duty as a flood detector if you hook up the proper probe. You can use your alarm panel to monitor other standalone systems, such as this circuit. It monitors your dishwasher or toilet for a leak, stops the leak, and then sends a message to your alarm panel. You can do the same thing for your water heater and washing machines. Do you have a medical condition or a healthy dose of paranoia? You can carry around this emergency transmitter. A simple press of a button will activate the alarm. Or you can mount a permanent panic button in a place that you spend a lot of time, like your master bedroom. Your alarm system can be used to control your household lighting. This 6272 control panel can utilize a system called X10 to control your lights from this touch screen. Or you can use the 5875 RF lamp module to turn a light on or off using the same fob that you use for turning on and off your alarm. I'd like to briefly mention some alarm outputs. You can have an indoor siren, an outdoor siren, a flashing strobe light to draw attention to your house, even combine the siren and the strobe light in one unit. Here's the one I really like, an auto dialer system. Instead of paying some stranger 30 bucks a month to listen for the phone call, why don't you have your alarm system call you? You can have it call several different phone numbers, deliver messages that you've recorded yourself, and has two separate activation inputs. You can have one for alarm, one for fire. Finally, you can drive a relay panel. Using this panel, your outputs are limited only by your imagination. You can do stuff like this fog machine over in Britain. When their alarm activates, a 2,000 square foot building can fill up with fog so thick you can't see 2 inches. It takes about 15 seconds. I guess I should throw in a disclaimer. I am not a professional alarm installer. I'm just some guy that likes to teach himself new skills, then pass it on to others. Thanks for watching.